I want to look at uncountable sets some more, and I want to look at um, there's a kind of point of view that might say, well, this is obviously true. As long as you accept the idea that infinite sets could have different sizes, um, there a picture, sort of a pictorial argument, might make you think that it's actually kind of obvious that the real numbers are a bigger kind of infinity than the natural numbers. So here's a, a very schematic picture of the natural numbers. It's just a bunch of dots. You just take a number line and you just put a mark at exactly at each uh, natural number. Okay, so that's a rather thin set, whereas the real number line is every possible real number line. It's this big chunky continuous uh, line with no gaps. Okay, M maybe that makes it just clear that um, that this is a bigger kind of infinity. And I want to talk about how. And intuition helps you a little bit, but it can be very slippery. And it, it usually, it very often, gives you the wrong answer. But it's definitely an interesting thing to think about. In what sense is there sort of a pictorial notion of infinity? Um, and how does it correspond to Cantor's very precise notion of infinity? OK. So one way to say it more technically is the natural numbers is a discrete set that at every point in the set there's no, that has no near neighbors. R is definitely not discrete. It's actually very continuous. Um, another way to say it is n is, an, is a zero-dimensional set. A point, a single point is zero-dimensional. Well, this isn't really a one-dimensional thing. It's just a bunch of zero-dimensional things put together. So it's really zero-dimensional in a very precise sense, where r is one-dimensional in a very precise sense. So maybe the conjecture is, well, that's, that's why um, their cardinalities are different, why r is really bigger. Okay. Well, what about? Uh, if you go to a two-dimensional set, a plane, okay? So imagine a plane, infinite in all directions, although it doesn't have to be, it really actually doesn't matter. Um, it could just be a finite subset of, a pl of the plane. But the main thing is that near any point, I can go sort of in, in this direction, horizontally or vertically, and I get an incredible amount of neighbors, um, very, very different from n, and it seems like maybe different from r. Okay, so if we are using this kind of intuition, we might say, oh, well, of course, we should have expected zero dimensional, one kind of infinity, one dimensional, bigger infinities, really honestly bigger, even by the cardinal comparison method. Okay, the plane, two dimensional, clearly bigger. Okay, I don't think uh, I should be able to sort of line up all these points in the plane with, the, with, the, with R. In particular, that would be some sort of curve, if I could map every point in here to every point in here, it would be some sort of curve maybe that would fill out the entire plane. That did not seem very likely to be possible in the uh, you know, two-thirds of the way through the 19th century. Okay. Well, it turns out, um, I'm not going to prove this exact fact for you, but it turns out that a two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional space, even n-dimensional space, all have the same cardinalities to real numbers. This argument is really not accurate. This is not, this is at least, this argument is not why r was bigger than n. It's not dimensionality. Um, and Cantor showed this, um, and he was so surprised by it that he said um, in a letter um, in French, je le vois mais le, je ne le crois pas. I see it, but I don't believe it. And so he had a hard time believing this, because I think he maybe had this intuition, or at least some version of this intuition, at the start of his researches on infinity. Okay. So here's another example, the rational numbers. So remember, the rational numbers is all ratios of rational numbers. There's plenty of irrational numbers. All the question is, how many? Hmm, we'll think about that in a minute. Okay. The picture, though, is um, it's a lot like the picture for R. Um, if I actually put a dot, a tiny little black dot of ink, at every point that's rational, I'm not going to notice any gaps. Yes, there's things like pi and root 2 that aren't there, but the fact is that any irrational number, something that I'm missing, it can be approximated arbitrarily well by rationals. I can get as close as I want to. And in fact, I can get an infinite number of things arbitrarily close, uh, uh, as, as close as I want to. So like pi, you can take this, this sequence 3, 3.1, 3.14, 3.141, etc. And that's things that are getting very, very, very close to pi. Okay, So there's definitely no big holes in the picture for Q. It's subtly different from R. But there's nothing you can stick your fist through. Um, and it's a very subtle question, exactly, you know, how is it different? But um, if we're just looking at a pictorial reason and, and we're trying to think very vaguely and get intuition, it's not, it doesn't seem a lot different from R. Okay, so our intuition might say, all right, um, N is really thin and discrete. Q is not discrete, um, although maybe continuous isn't the best word for it. So maybe Q should also, should be more like R than like N.
should be uncountable. Well, turns out it's countable. So um, what, what I'm doing here is you might think is another version of the diagonalization argument. It's actually the opposite of that. I'm going to lay things out in a grid, but I'm actually going to use it to, pr to prove that a, a certain set is countable, namely the rationals. Okay, So we're going to put, um, well, we'd like to put all the rationals in a 2D grid, but minus signs just are annoying. And so trust me, minus signs don't make it uh, any different. Um, I'm going to put all the rationals in a 2D grid. So the denominator 1 here, denominator 2, denominator 3, and then the different, oh, those are numerators, just kidding. Uh, and the denominators, the different denominators in the different columns. Okay, So that's a grid that if you extend it infinitely in, in both directions, that's going to give you all at least the positive rationals. Okay. Now note, um, this is going to repeat a bunch of things. 1 over 1, 2 over 2, 3 over 3, 4 over 4. That's okay, because if I can show that this list, even repeating stuff, is countable, then certainly throwing stuff away it will be fine. Okay. It's just easier to not worry about the whole repetition thing. Okay. And as I said, if you want to deal with negatives, uh, you can do it. It's just It doesn't change the argument much. Okay. So here's the way to do it. Okay. We have this grid. And I'm just going to do a zigzag pattern to put them in a sequence. Okay, one over one, one over two, two over one, three over one, two over two, one over three, etc. Okay, okay. So notice what I'm doing. This is very different from the diagonalization argument. In the diagonalization argument, each row was a single number, and I was using the diagonalization argument to create a new row, a new decimal, decimal number that couldn't be on the list. Here, each thing in the grid is a separate number, and I'm trying to have this snaky path between them. That wouldn't have made that wouldn't have been interesting in the diagonalization picture, because the entries in each of the s slots would have been just numbers from the digits zero to nine. I know the digits are countable. Not interesting. Okay, but here I've got all the rational numbers laid out, and um, it's pretty easy to turn this into a formula if you want. But it's pretty clearly a systematic way of putting them in order. And that's uh, a way of making, knowing that the rationals are countable. Okay. Um, so one thing that tells you is that uh, irrationals, the irrationals must be uncountable. Okay. It's easy to see, it's easy to show, I haven't shown it, but it's easy to show if you take the union of two countable sets, um, just put them next to each other, then that's countable as well, the total. Um, and so since R isn't countable, uh, where's all that uncountability coming from? It's not coming from Q. It's actually rather thin and rather small uh, by Cantor's reasoning. Um, and so, in fact, the irrationals are overwhelmingly dominant in the rational numbers. If you pick a random real number, in fact, the probability that it's rational is zero. It's 100% probable that it's going to be irrational. There's a lot more irrationals than rationals. That's that's a cool fact in itself. Okay, so. Even though Q is dense in R, this fact that you can get arbitrarily close to any real number, irrational or rational, with a bunch of other rationals, um, it's still kind of thin. And so this picture of saying, thinking, oh, it's kind of like just a line. It's one dimensional. It's going to be bigger than N. It, that's, again, not very accurate. Here's pushing that even further, that idea of you know, how, much, how good is our intuition about these things? The answer is not very good unless you really work on the definitions and think about them. Um, this is a famous example due to Cantor called the Cantor set. Um, it's not only a great example for thinking about infinity, it actually does relate uh, pretty precisely to the researches that got him actually into thinking about infinity, which were about particular sets of real numbers. So here it's very cool. You start with a line segment. Oh, it's also the world's first fractal um, in a sense. You start with a line segment. And so let's say it's from 0 to 1 on the real number line. It doesn't really matter, so I didn't really label it. Okay, But if you wanted to make it uh, very explicit. It's just all the numbers from 0 to 1 inclusive on the real number line. Remove the middle third. Remove everything from 1 third to 2 thirds. I'm not removing the endpoints. Let's keep the endpoints. Okay. Um, then remove their middle thirds. Okay. And so the, the so far the, the set is this guy. So that's the zeroth stage of construction. Here's the first stage of construction. Here's the second stage. At every stage, I'm going to remove the middle third. You can guess what I'm going to do next. Remove the middle third of that, middle third of that, middle third of that, middle third of that. OK? Continue. So I'm not going to draw any more, because it's kind of laborious. But the idea is you remove the middle third of that, and then move middle thirds of those guys, remove middle thirds, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you might, make, might wonder, is it possible to, quote, continue indefinitely? What does that mean? Is there some final answer? There absolutely is. It's just um, you make the list of all these guys, 
and, uh, and sort of give an explicit procedure for creating all the finite stages and then say a point is in the final set, the cantor set, if it's in all of the ones on the list. It, by the rules of set theory, um, it's a perfectly good construction. But, okay, let's see what's interesting about it. The first stage had length one. I removed a third of it, so the second one, the total length is two-thirds. At the, at the this is stage two, if you start with stage zero here, um, it has length four-ninths, two-thirds of two-thirds, so two-thirds squared, then eight twenty-sevenths. Well, the pattern here is two-thirds to the nth power. And so eventually, the length of the final thing is going to be length zero. That's rather, that seems rather small, okay? It's not an empty set. That's very, very crucial. It's not an empty set because, for, for example, I never removed any of the endpoints. And that's what I said a minute ago, that don't remove the endpoints of, say, at the first stage. Leave the endpoints. Leave the endpoints here. Leave. There's a bunch of endpoints. And, in fact, the number of endpoints increases as 2 to the n as you go. So there's a lot of points in here. In fact, an infinite set of points. Um, but it's very dust-like because um, you never have, there's no finite length anywhere in this thing. The total length is 0. So certainly in the final set, even though this guy has a nice little, uh, nice little interval, continuous interval from here to here that's included, that's going to get broken up. And then any other interval you'd like to be in it, that's eventually going to get broken up um, by taking out the middle third. So it seems the picture, if you could draw this, it's very dust-like. It seems more like the discrete dots of n. So it's got length 0. It seems close to the, closer to the discrete kind of thing than either q or r was. So wow, if q was countable, and it seemed like it was filling out a lot of this, this line, this segment, um, then I would think this would be countable. But in fact, this guy turns out to be uncountable. Um, Again, I won't prove that, but you can actually kind of prove it by a variant of the diagonal argument. Um, so this guy is a very weird dust kind of set, a fractal dust, and uh, yet it's uncountable. It's bigger, in a set theory terms, than the entire rational numbers. Or, say, um, a plane where all the points are rational, or an n-dimensional space where all the points are rational. You can construct some sets that seem really big, uh, sort of by this geometrical reasoning, and yet are quite small in terms of measuring infinities using set theory. That's where I'm going to stop right now.